<laughs> Greetings, witches and wizards of America! This is the Hogwarts Chaplain speaking to you from the Room of Requirement. It is the 16th of February. My dear friends, the current Muggle president had a press conference this afternoon, and it was alarming. It was the usual combination of undisciplined narcissism and deceit, but it went on and on. Some of you may have missed it, but if you have read Professor Rowling's seven-volume history, you have actually seen this scene before. Because as I looked at each word flying out of the mouth of the undisciplined speaking current Muggle president, they reminded me of Cornish pixies. Yes, my friends, if you can remember the first Defense Against the Dark Arts class of Professor Gilderoy Lockhart, if you can remember what that looked like, you did see today's press conference. Cornish pixies flying around set loose by the so-called leader in the room, only to have the leader flee, having caused more deceit and confusion and harm than he could manage, and other magicians had to come and clean it up. So let the cleanup begin, my friends, and we will not be part of that. We are instead going to live into the mission of the WWN to focus on the challenges to social justice. So we will instead focus on mosquitoes sent this week by the current Muggle president. In service of humanity, witches and wizards, muggles alike, we are going to maintain a mosquito net in which we will gather all of the mosquitoes that he speaks, 140 characters at a time and we will sort through them for their policy implications. So as we go through the many <clears throat> mosquitoes, scent, swarming, we are going to focus on this one related to healthcare. <clears throat> Says the Muggle president, I was asked about healthcare by Anderson Cooper and have been consistent. I will repeal all of Obamacare, including the mandate, period. Exclamation point. This particular mosquito reminds us that healthcare is a complicated issue. The question is, is it a human right? We go to the works of the great professor Joanne Rowling, who introduces us to the concept of the healthcare system in the magical world. And she does it at a place called St. Mungo's Hospital. Those of you who are witches and wizards may have been there yourselves or may have visited someone there. But for the purpose of those who may not know of this place, let's have a little reading. When Harry Potter first arrives, he's never heard of St. Mungo's Hospital, so perhaps you are in the same situation. Harry says to Ron, are they doctors? Doctors, said Ron, looking startled. Those muggle nutters that cut people up? No, they're healers. And as Harry moves around the hospital and sees that everyone there who's a part of other people's health care are called healers, he then sees a sign on the wall that says, if you are unsure where to go, incapable of normal speech, or unable to remember why you are here, our welcome witch will be pleased to help you. Harry gets a sense of the welcome, the care, you don't even have to know who you are to be cared for at St. Mungo's Hospital. There were only three patients in the room. Mr. Weasley was occupying the bed at the far end of the ward beside the tiny window. Harry was pleased and relieved to see he was propped up on several pillows and reading the Daily Prophet by the solitary ray of sunlight falling onto his bed. He looked around as they walked toward him and seeing whom it was, beamed. Hello, he cried, throwing the prophet aside. Bill just left, Molly. Had to get back to work, but he says he'll drop on on you later. How are you, Arthur? asked Mrs. Weasley, bending down to kiss his cheek and looking anxiously in his face. You're looking a bit peaky. I'm absolutely fine, said Mr. Weasley brightly, holding out his good arm to give Ginny a hug. If they could only take the bandages off, I'd be fit to go home. Anyway, said Mr. Weasley, this time Willie's been caught selling biting doorknobs to muggles, and I don't think he'll be able to worm his way out of it, because according to this article, two muggles have lost fingers and are now in St. Mungo's for emergency bone regrowth and memory modification. Just think of it. Muggles in St. Mungo's! 
I wonder which ward they're in. On Christmas Day, Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Ginny go back to visit Mr. Weasley again. The reception area looked pleasantly festive. The crystal orbs that illuminated St. Mungo's had been turned to red and gold, so that they became gigantic, glowing Christmas bulbs. Holly hung around every doorway, and shining white Christmas trees covered in magical snow and icicles glittered in every corner, each topped with a gleaming gold star. The chapter goes on, and I encourage you to keep reading it, as Harry sees the care and the love delivered at St. Mungo's Hospital. But whether that was the first time you heard that passage, or the hundredth, I ask you this question. What if you had to pay on your own for the health care at St. Mungo's? Do you really think the Weasleys could afford that? Ron can't even buy sweeties off the trolley on the Hogwarts Express. He has to use a broken wand. All the Weasleys wear hand-me-down robes, and often their textbooks were donated. But there is no talk of that at St. Mungo's. And not only do they take care of all wizards who pay taxes and create the system that delivers health care to everyone, but according to Mr. Weasley, muggles can even get health care in that system. Now, muggles do not pay taxes to the Ministry of Magic. My friends, muggles are the uninsured in the magical world. And yet they, too, are receiving treatment and care from healers at St. Mungo's. So the question of whether or not a just society offers health care to its members is answered definitively, lovingly, certainly, by Professor Rowling. But what if you were the kind of person that hasn't read that story, and you're wondering, how do I make an argument that health care is, in fact, a human right? My friends, let's go to the scriptures. Now, it would be inauthentic, though creative, for me to try to find the verse or the verses about a health care system. I must confess to you that phrase health care system is not in the scripture. And to pretend that it is, is not right. But you may say to yourself, so the scripture has nothing to say. My friends, M&Ms are not in the scriptures. But do you think there's no wisdom in the scriptures about how one ought to treat their M&Ms? That you should not binge on M&Ms and not eat anything else and be gluttonous with them? That you should not hoard M&Ms from other people? You might want to share them if people don't have any. You should not steal M&Ms from other people. You should not covet your neighbor's M&Ms. The truth is the scriptures have a great deal to say about many things that are not in them. My training to be the Hogwarts chaplain was in the Episcopal tradition. And in that tradition, the Bible is cherished as the word of God, not because it talks about everything, but because it talks about things that matter in a way that lets it apply to everything. So what are the passages that we can apply to the question of whether or not healthcare is a human right? And if we are part of the resistance, these are answers we have to be prepared to give. I bring you back to the Hebrew scriptures, to the 25th chapter of the book of Leviticus, where we find verses that explain exactly why healthcare is a human right. In the 25th chapter of the book of Leviticus, you hear the story of what's called the Jubilee year. The people of Israel, every 50th year, believed that all slaves would be freed in the 50th year. All debts would be forgiven in the 50th year. All mortgages, all grudges, prisoners would be released in the 50th year. The belief was to purify, to make loving and holy. The economy was that every lifetime would have one time, about 50 years, where everything was liberated, where the bondage in every form, land, finances, debts, criminal justice, every form of bondage by law would be forgiven. But of course, it's not that there are verses about moving from bondage to freedom in the scripture. The whole scripture is the story of our being in bondage and God leading us to freedom. Our being in Egypt and God leading us to the promised land. There is not a verse about being freed from bondage. There is an entire Bible about being freed from bondage. 
That is not only the message of the scripture, it is the invitation to everyone who reads it to care for the liberation of everyone and to practice jubilee. Do you want to know a group of people that got this idea and decided to do something with it? <clears throat> From the Declaration of Independence, one of the great productions of the Mughals. A sentence worth meditating on. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Do you know what that sounds like, my friends? Jubilee. And it is Jubilee. A group of people who had been suffering in the bondage and tyranny of a crazy monarch gathered together and inspired by the Judeo-Christian tradition wanted to create a land in which there would not be bondage. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness that not only would your actual health be preserved, but if anything would impede your ability to pursue happiness, that impediment should be removed. My friends, if you have ever been sick, if you have ever loved or even known someone who is sick, I ask you, is there any form of more depressing and seemingly permanent bondage than illness? Even slaves have the rare chance of escape. Those of you who have been ill know there is no escape. If these scriptures, if this document, if our Constitution aim to protect from any form of bondage, they must intend to protect from the rare and certain form of bondage that is illness. No, these documents don't talk about a health care system, but they guarantee, they explain, and they promote the idea that your creator and mind, wizards, witches, and muggles, your creator, in the words of the great wizard Paul, created you for freedom. Says wizard Paul, it is for freedom that you have been set free. There is not a verse calling for universal health care. There is an entire scripture. There is an entire group of founding documents. That is what this country is about. What is Jubilee? What does it look like? Well, according to the people that wrote the Declaration of Independence, the end of monarchy and the beginning of liberty and the creation of our country was that its citizens would be freed from the impediments to the pursuit of happiness. My friends, the current Muggle president has named a Minister for Health and Human Services, Dr. Tom Price. Those of you in the resistance, listen carefully. We have got to find a way to communicate to Minister Price these ideas, because sadly, he is quite hostile to this notion that you and I owe health care to anyone. Health care is seen as a form of charity, of compassion, of goodness, but not a right. Think of the Weasleys. You should not need wealth to receive care, to be helped to pursue happiness. Minister Price, the witches and wizards and muggles of the resistance ask you this. If these documents mean anything to you, if you believe they hold a claim on you, as you have said in many public places that they do, we stand together and say, Mr. Price, please agree that health care is a human right. Not because we are asking you to be liberal or progressive or democrat. We are asking you to be a conservative, to be a constitutional literalist, to take the Bible seriously. These are the documents you say matter the world to you. So please, believe your own convictions. Healthcare is a human right, my friends. Everywhere and always. This is the WWN. Thank you for tuning in to Word and Wizard Network, where we are trying to give spiritual resources to your resistance. Tune in for our next episode, which is entitled Executive Orders, Centaurs, and the Rights of Native Communities. Thank you for your time, and until next time, be a seeker.